Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello and welcome to another episode of Mineral Talks Live, the weekly mineral talk show broadcasting to you live every Wednesday. I'm Brian Swoboda, president of Blue Cap Productions, and boy, do we have a special show for you today. For those of you who are tuning into the program for the first time, Mineral Talks Live is a weekly webinar put on by myself representing Blue Cap Productions, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez representing the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayou representing the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP. We try to make our program as interactive as possible for you. So let us, uh, let me quickly describe how you can participate in every show. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a series of buttons. There's one button labeled chat, another button labeled Q&A. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching and participating in the show. When you first sign on, go ahead and fire off a chat message to everyone introducing yourself and telling us where you're from. Now, during the interview, our guests and I will be focused on our conversation and not really looking at the chat window. However, both Raquel and Eloise will be very active in those chats, so look for their comments along with everyone else. In addition to that, at times, either Raquel or Eloise may interject during the interview with questions that you're asking so that we can get an immediate answer from our guests while they're still on the topic. Now, the second way to interact with the program is through the Q&A function, and this is, uh, allows you to submit general questions that we'll try to answer at the end of the interview. These are for things that we haven't covered during the, uh, during the talk, but that you're interested in knowing anyway. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you may see a window pop up on the screen asking a bunch of questions for our weekly poll. This is just a bit of fun where you can try to predict how our guests will answer the 10 questions on the poll. And it's a way for you to get, the, get to know our guests a little bit better. And we also usually give a prize. I'm gonna give you a quick preview of the prize that we have today. This is the great, it's a, uh, a slice of a uh, malachite stalactite or stalagmite probably, uh, probably stalactite. Um, and that is being given away at the end of the show, courtesy of our guests today. So you are going to want to stick around to the very end so that you could hear how you can win that. So with that, let's start our program. Today's guest is broadcasting to us live from Fallbrook, California, in northern San Diego County. You've no doubt heard his name. We'd like to welcome Bill Larson. <laughs> Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So we're in... Uh... Beautiful Fallbrook. Uh, we've, uh, you know, been here for over 50 years. You are very well aware that Palo was started by your father and myself uh, in 1968. And uh, we started, I went into the military almost immediately, but I had met your dad. He was uh, a judge at the Del Mar Fair, where I was relatively well known as a small monster uh, since I was like 12 and I started competing there. And he would judge my thumbnails and I, and, and I lost. And I'd won like for four years in a row and I gave him a big argument. He said, well, you know, that's fair. And he said, why don't you come up and see me? I've got an idea. Well, it turns out your dad had bought the Stuart mine. My father knew Monty Moore and he had the Queen mine, the Chief mine, the Ocean View mine. And then Ed was able to finance it. Uh, we started our company and uh, the rest is kind of history, as you well know. So we're going to start here uh, in uh, our mineral office. You'll see some books. I love libraries. I have lots. And this is called The Hidden Room by Some, The Secret Room by Others, but it does have an excellent San Diego County collection in it, which shows the variety of things found here in San Diego County. We did about our, our company up until 1980. We just did the, the steward, the chief, the ocean view a little bit and of course the term lean queen is where we found the great stuff there were other places where we went in and didn't find anything but uh that's mining so here's a queen mine tourmaline not a blue cap but a beautiful stone that i remember very well selling at the detroit show because we we're always running out of money uh to keep mining going i sold it for two thousand dollars to a very fine mexican collector <laughs> and then about 
in the in the late '90s, early 2000s, I bought it from his son back for uh, five times more than he'd paid for it. Uh, one of the reasons that Ed and I got along was with Josie Scripps, one of my great mentors. We had mined three projects while I was waiting to be drafted into the military. And we went to the little three. She had a lease with Louis Spalding Jr. And we found a pocket, and you'll see the topaz is in court. So I literally dug that and before I met Ed Sabota. And then we did another project. We, did, we found aquamarines at the Mac mine, and we'd found herderites uh, in, in Chihuahua Valley. So I'd had some great success as a collector. Um, all my, you know, since I was 12 years old, I, when I met John Sinkankas, we went up to the Benitoite mine, and he was very kind, and we went out and dug naturalites and all sorts of things with John. He became a lifelong mentor. So really, uh, I was very lucky. And of course, Josie Scripps was like my other mother, and she and my mom got along well. My dad, whatever I collected, they liked. And this room is fun because it has all sorts of beautiful things in it. Bill, going back to that San Diego County case, yes. that wasn't organized by mines on the different shelves. It's just a little bit yeah, of a all sorts of yeah, just be by beauty. I mean, there's there's a little three mine here. Here's a tourmaline queen. Here's the latest failure I had. <laughs> the mountain lily we mined. We put in a thousand feet of underground tunnel and found uh, one pocket of nice tourmaline. But I mean, you know, you know how expensive mining is. So is that there's the white hundred thousand dollar Doral. Uh, that's that's uh, yeah. I remember showing that in uh, Westward Look. Everybody enjoyed it. It's out outside here in frame. <laughs> so yeah, we lost uh, seven figures in mining over five years. So you know, it's not easy. Hey, Bill, so, do you have any beautiful that are, like, clean in there? I have several. I think the white queen is interesting because uh, we'll probably never see anything from that that location again. That's correct. It it belongs to the Pali Indians now. And uh, this is an, an old one. It went to Europe. And what's funny is when the collection resold to a European, very top dealer, he didn't understand that it was good. And they priced it very reasonably compared to what Norm Dawson probably charged back in the... So I was lucky I knew Norm Dawson very, very well. I know his son now, who has had some success. Uh, here's a, a pallet chief where, where they're mining. Uh, Dawson was mining. You might be able to see a little color, not much. A little bit oh, yeah, dark. Yeah, no, we can see that. Nice okay. green on top and uh, yes. nice red on the Classic bottom. Classic pallet chief. Here, Bill's... show them the big white queen. The big white queen. Oh, yeah. Here. Sorry, it's a, it's a centerpiece. So we have it over here. It's too big. It doesn't fit in the collection. There's a nice white queen. You can see on the sides here where the spodumene coon sites grew. And then, of course, uh, being volatile over the millennia, they dissolved. That's a fantastic piece. Yeah, that's a big one. Historic. Absolutely. So another thing that started me collecting was Baja California. So I've created probably one of the, if not the finest, certainly finer than any I know, including museums, uh, Baja California collection. So you have, I mean, a lot of it was from Josie Scripps. Uh, she was kind enough to give me her collection uh, several weeks before she passed, knew that I would take good care of it. And we donated to 14 different museums, including the Smithsonian, uh, LA County, all sorts of places, so that her legacy would be uh, uh, preserve, but I mean, this is one of her pieces. That was one of her pieces. This is this is from the famous uh, Delicious mine in Baja California, which probably still is good, but uh, it's not able to be mined. I know the owners, and they would love us to mine, but you know that there's problems in Mexico. Is that in during, northern in Baja or areas. southern Baja? Northern Baja. It's inland from Ensenada, and it's on a uh, on a route that you don't want to be mining in. Yeah. The interior of this is deep. Fabulous rubellite. That's from the most famous mine. That's El Socorro. The Smithsonian has a piece that came from Josie and it's still unrepaired. You can see the dark rubellite. But many things came from Baja. There's the chrome spheans, the little twin crystals. If you're a thumbnail collector, you go crazy for those. Right. So in many of these, I self-collected. Here's a project that Ed Sabota wanted to do very badly and I, with, with me. We did it. Uh, John McLean has probably more trips down to Baja than he wants to count, but we actually hit Boleite, and uh, these are all things from the mining venture, which we did. Everybody wanted Boleite until we hit them. I remember that them. mine quite well. As a kid, I jumped on a, a fully uh, loaded ore cart and rode it up the incline and gave awesome. just about everybody a heart attack. 
<laughs> your dad did well there too as he was getting some of the local shells and uh, carving them up and putting them in his jewelry line so it was it was a sort of a win-win thing but the only laughing thing was we sort of both learned that we should only mine what you can sell the scraps of like gem material if you have cracked crystals once we had boleite nobody wanted it anymore it was really sad because we didn't get big ones, we didn't get hard matrixes, but I mean, we had thousands of crystals and that's, you know, they, they stayed that way. That was a good lesson. <laughs> many, many mining lessons. Always so hard. minerals have been my life all, you know, I've, I've been lucky to be with museums. I have wonderful, wonderful mentors, not just Josie and John St. Cancus, but Dr. Peter Bancroft, who used to compete. You know, we already mentioned Norm Dawson. And because I was a punk kid, when I was 12, 14, 16, especially in the Del Mar Fair, they all got to know me. I got to know them. And I wrote the Colorado School of Mines when I was 12. And uh, damned if I didn't get a scholarship to go there uh, when I graduated <laughs> from high school. So then I spent four years at, in Colorado, learned a lot. There was Merle Reed at the Crystal Gallery. He had the exceptional uh, pieces that would come in there, including the great rhodochrosite, which went to Peter Bancroft and wound up with Ed Swoboda and is now the, one of the featured minerals in uh, the Sam's collection of the Eastern Museums. So, yep. you know, it's a really small world. What, ben, uh, goes on. do you have yes. any uh, common jade from Baja? Yeah, the good ones are probably in my home, but here's a matrix, which is extraordinarily rare, a common jade. I don't have anything like, like the French Museum has, but but I do have Comanchites. There's a big pseudo boleite matrix. And then yeah, there's you usually had to uh, stabilize the matrix using that Elmer's glue water mix, correct? Right, right. You want the fun story about when I kept telling Ed not to do it anymore? Uh -huh. So I sold a bunch to a Belgian dealer and he spoke no English. He was a friend of Gilbert Gautier, another great mentor of mine. And this guy could not tell me what he was trying to tell me. He was really upset with boleites and finally took a razor blade, scraped the matrix, took a match and lit it on fire. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't put boleites in glue anymore. Well, you, you, you had to look at it the that other preservation way. It was, failed. A, it was a great fire starter in case you got stranded down in uh, Oh, in man. Oh, man. Well, we just didn't get lucky. We didn't hit Comanchites. If we didn't hit Comanchites, it would have been the end of the world, so. Yeah. They're hitting them now, which is interesting. There's a Canadian company down there, and they are hitting a few. So here's pretty minerals all over the place. I mean, I love tanzanite. Somebody asked me about favorite tanzanites. Here's good tanzanites. They're not fabulous tanzanite, but they're pretty damn good. I mean, I, I first went to Africa in 1971, and I met John Saul, and I met Jerry Rousseau, and uh, on a trip that Ed and I took, that we went all over the world, literally. So I was, I was into Tanzania pretty early. 71 was three years after Tanzanite and Samurai was found. So I did a lot of business early on. And Tanzanite used to be rare as hell. I mean, you can't imagine how rare it was. Nobody right. had much of it. Uh, so it was interesting to keep going back and forth to Africa. I have over 40 trips to Africa in my life, uh, including one with my son, Will, who's holding the camera diligently here. Uh, I was the featured speaker, the guest speaker for the first East African Gem Conference, and that was kind of fun. We had it several hundred people. So, you know, I've, I've been very blessed. And I, I've told you, Brian, I started going to the Orient uh, uh, 1974, which is after Africa. My first trip was Sri Lanka, and I wound up in Bangkok. And, of course, I was getting more and more involved in gems. So Bangkok was one of the great centers besides Eder Oberstein. Um, the Edar was my other place I, in, in Germany. I have 70 some trips into Edar because we were selling our tourmaline rough there. Uh, it was before Nigeria and places like that. So we still had a very good market for the, for the poor quality tourmaline or, or cabochon and matrix, uh, you know, the uh, material that could be carved sometimes. I met Gerhard Becker, uh, Eckhart Patch, the Wills, both Wills. I mean, we had I had a lot of fun in Edar too. So between, I mean, I've probably been irradiated more on planes than most people <laughs> flying all over the world. Now, Bill, when did you make that so, uh, yeah. kind of switch from just minerals to minerals and gemstones? You're known very well in both worlds. And so 
what right what, well when we yeah. first started uh, ed and i i mean we had the stewart mine and we were producing tourmaline i would take it to a local guy here named schneider his son still is in the business and uh, the schneiders were really famous and i would try and sell them uh, the crystals and there weren't enough crystals and i tried to sell them the rough and you know the price difference between the rough and the finished stones was probably 10 to 1 then uh, mm -hmm. i would sell it for 10 dollars a gram and and they would produce at least 20%. So, and then they would get $100 a carat, even back in those days, for flawless, beautiful stuff from the steward. So that started to make sense. And I would take this stuff to EDAR. And the better material, I found out the cutters there. We had a few local cutters. And actually, we hired cutters. John McLean's wife cut for me. She trained one of her girlfriends. So we had a whole lapidary here at our, our headquarters in Fallbrook. Uh, we cut here for years and years, hundreds of stones, thousands of stones, and that became more profitable than minerals uh, for, for us. And it was, you know, you always hate to sell a treasured mineral, but a cut stone, there's always another cut stone. You know, they're, they're unique, but they're not as unique. So I would say in the mid, mid 70s, we were really strong in gems, but we didn't get really big until the 80s. And then I, I made a decision to go more into sapphire. And today, Sapphire is our palace's largest seller. So that's under my other son, Carl. And he runs the, the cut stone. Well, we do a major business in Sapphire. So you'll see a 30 carat Burma lighter that's pretty outstanding. So no here's a, another a collection. This is all uh, Soviet Union uh, of the old days. Now it's Russia, Ukraine, and various places. But the emerald back there is pretty amazing, even uh, for the museums in Russia. They don't have many really large emeralds with fine color and perfectly terminated, no repair. Nice. That probably came out more than 100 years ago. The most successful mining I ever had was in the 90s and the 2000s. That was for Dementoid Garnet. There's a crystal. They're pretty rare, but we got a pocket of of uh, Dementoids or several in uh, the Karkodno mine and then later in 2004 in the Kladovka mine and that was the most successful mining I ever had and of course the Russians they got two-thirds of the production I got one-third so you imagine we were really were successful because it, it paid for everything it was quite amazing so I think we should probably head up uh, okay. if there's any questions as we go you're going to see we have a beautiful uh, two and a half acre uh, property here so and everybody is welcome to come and visit everybody's <laughs> welcome. just call ahead make sure we're here you'll see there's collections all over the place beautiful quartz collection brundum collection barrel collection hey bill as we're going you talked about josie scripps and uh what a mentor and influencer she was to you Talk to us about <clears throat> kind of your perspective on mentors and how important they are to today's mineral collectors. Well, if I've had success in the business, it's because I knew a lot of people and they were very, you know, mineral people are usually very generous with their time, uh, especially for young people. Um, you know, and I, I try to do it now because I, and luckily I'm not quite as young as I ever was, but uh, you know, I had blessings because I knew everybody. It was unbelievable. When you have a gem mine, or if you're a good self collector, everybody wants to know you. So it really worked out. I mean, I knew all the museum guys because of the blue cap pocket we found in 1970, late 71, 72. All the museum people came here, literally to this uh, place. Of course, it was a little smaller then. Here's one of our mini rooms with the internet. That's a really fine geologist, now a gemologist. That's Jason Stevenson. He handles extremely hey Jason, good to valuable see you, buddy. gemstones. So you see, we have complete uh, laboratory for photography. We have more libraries. This is a gemological library. We're just going to go to my office rather than looking at all the interesting things. So I'm not here as often as I should be because I travel a great deal. Although under the last four months, for some reason, I haven't traveled much. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> so, so we got a lot of projects done. My beautiful daughter-in-law and my son, William, are helping me label and uh, put on a video uh, miniature mineral specimens. We got through about 
oh, maybe uh, 250 or 300 specimens so far. I have about 2,000 really fine minerals, of which you'll see a few. Now, a few weeks ago, you saw Patrick Dreyer. So this is his latest piece, and you, many people know I collect his work. That's due to my son, Will, and Carl, sons. And this is a piece I think you'll appreciate. It's from a very rare mineral. Will, uh, can you stand the rock. camera down a little bit so that uh, we can look at the piece? Yeah, there we go. It's fantastic. It's from a rock called Mao Sitsi. And this is his latest piece. One piece of Mao Sitsi. I bought it at the Burmese auction. And then it's a long story how it got here because it wound up with a different dealer that I sold a collection to and it came back to me. And then I sent it to Gerd Dreyer and he didn't think it was easy to card, which it was not. But Patrick spent a great deal of time and made a, I think a fabulous uh, gecko. Man, you can you notice know, how the eyes watch you. Right now, that's, that's fantastic. You know, I, I'm, I wonder how, how the faces of everyone watching right now look like. <laughs> By the comments going through, Bill, I'm sorry you cannot, you cannot read. Everyone is like, wow, holy Moses. <laughs> well, hopefully That's Patty one piece of mouse sits it. You know, a, a, a small piece of mouse sits it like this, extremely valuable when it's this quality. I just got lucky because it was in the auction and then I was able to uh, sell the collection I had and then I was traded back for the now, so, Bill, is Mao like a local Burmese name for the mineral? And is there it's a, a city name? and it was named by Dr. Google and it's in an article and he's the one who suggested that name and it's stuck because okay. it's not one. It's got chloromelanite in it, I think, or cosmochlor, uh, some chrome jadeite. Uh, there's other. I mean, Raquel is a, a petrologist. She knows. I don't know what else is in it, Raquel. I think it's eight minerals. Yes, it's a beautiful has carving and it's and beautiful material. Yeah, it's, it, this is really top. I mean, this is as good as it gets. I was really, I fought to get this piece in the auction. And uh, actually, because the Burmese were used to it, they didn't realize how special this piece was. Patrick has another half. So <laughs> this, was, this was the best half. But it, it's another one almost as big as this. I just, you know, we, we, we've got to have another idea. Okay, we're going to see more things from Patrick. This is a piece Will and I found in his father's closet, literally, and it was two-thirds preform. And this is old ruby from Tanzania. Oh, yeah, I remember when he did that. That's and interestingly enough, your father, Ed Soboda, was one of the first to ever bring in the Tanzanian ruby and sold most of it to Kazanjan out of Beverly Hills, and they made that collection of presidents, carvings. Mm -hmm. You'll remember that, Brian. Oh, yeah. It's before your time. <laughs> Probably in the late 50s. I, it, it's, it's in our Palagems. You can look up Ed Sabota and Tanzanian Ruby. But this is an extraordinary piece because the color is exceptional. It's early on. Can you get the color? Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, this is a very special thing. Patrick was very excited to finish it up. So it's one of the pieces that that he did jointly with his father. His father uh, had uh, started this, and then we saw it. The, the base is tourmaline off of one of my other carvings, and then uh, obsidian. But, I mean, what a carving. It's uh, unbelievable. Well, you know, Patrick is an avid scuba diver, so any chance he yes. gets to work on aquatic animals is yes. a real passion project. And as we have a home in La Jolla, and that's the symbol of La Jolla, is seahorse. Oh, so there you go. My wife, Jeannie, loves seahorses, too. And then the one that's really famous uh, for us is the cover of the Dreyer book. Oh, right, the toad. The great toad. So who knows where this piece came? I mean, we know it's Brazil. We know it's a Raswahi area. It was brought to me in a fruit uh, box, wood, filled with agates and broken pieces. And this was ugly because it was shoral here and underneath. And you could barely see anything on it. It must have come from Peter Bancroft and sold to one of the, the lapidary people because he brought up all sorts of things from Brazil. And it was from Vista, California. And so we, I kept this for over 25 years and just, you know, I knew there was a possibility it would carve. And until Patrick Dreyer 
cut the shorls off. And then he like, I think he WhatsApped me immediately and said, you're not going to believe, but the piece has come alive. And his father took it over and his father spent off and on, I think five months carving this because he loved it. He said when he finished it, it was the greatest carving that he'd ever seen to come out of the Oberstein. I think there's seven or eight recognizable colors. One piece. That's amazing. And it's such a 6, great 6,300 carats. Yeah. It's such a great example of how a uncollectible mineral specimen can right. be repurposed into a absolutely wonderful work of art like this. And if it had gone to the wrong person or the less talented person, they might have sliced it up, made, made slices out of it. Anything could have happened. But <laughs> Gerd and Patrick, uh, they created something that's unbelievable. I mean, beyond their skill at actual carving, the ability of the Dreher family to be able to look into a piece and see a creature ready? is unprecedented. Look at that. You see there? I never knew the base was that green like that. That is fantastic. It's a really special piece. Um, he spent literally five months, as I remember. And, you know, the book was something was his lifelong dream. And, and between... Uh, uh, William and Carl, they got me involved with her. There had been a, uh, an, an American who had said he had an exclusive and we stayed away. And Gerd Dreher, when, I, when Carl and I met him, he said, oh, I thought Gerhard Becker kept you away. And we said, no, no, this guy kept us away. And he said, well, let's do things. And then the rest is history. I've, I now have 50 Dreyers and I couldn't be more proud. I had a lot of rough over the years. And, uh, you know, something like this, I mean, it, it cost nothing, I, you know, it was, but in the wrong hands, it would still be nothing. Right, right. I mean, and I love the fact that people are starting to understand that there is no barrier to access the talent of Dreher. Uh, it's That's correct. Just working alone, but, well, um, you know, <laughs> you great project, he'll take it. Yeah. He can do eight pieces a year, Brian. I know it. I know it. And That's he's, the barrier. He's rest. It's not I have easy. 30 pieces of rough with him, but my children will have to finish those. <laughs> right. <laughs> he won't get to all of those for a long, long while. All right, so carvings, great. you've seen Thank a few really time. good ones. I have more drayers, but not here. So we're going to look at my, my curators coming. Uh, Carl, my other son, is bringing the, uh, the gems. We're over there. We're going to take it over there. Now we'll, okay. we'll, come, we'll come over there. We'll come there. to you. Sorry. Rika, say hi. hi. <laughs> Don't try to hide behind She's the desk. <laughs> She's trying to hide. Yeah. Hey, hey Carl, how you doing? Good to see you, man. Hi, Carl. Good to see you guys. Well, Good Carl's the face of Pala for gemstones, so he's going to show you a few that he's told me not to sell So uh, over the years. This is just a little taste of what we like to play with. Um, you'll see some are big, some are small. Uh, mostly they're bright and happy, and that's what we like. So we're going to start from the right and go to the left. We have 132 karat rubellite from California. That's a queen mine. Uh, 21 karat bicolor from the uh, Himalaya mine. A 16 karat rubellite from the Stuart Lithia. A 14 karat Mozambique uh, neon pariba, depending on who you talk to, but copper bearing tourmaline. An 8 karat sabrite, really a juicy one from Tanzania. A 30 karat uh, Burmese sapphire, no heat. A 30 karat yellow sapphire from Sri Lanka, a 20 karat Burmese spinel, and an 80 karat Tanzanian, I mean Tanz Tanzanite, and that's just a lovely big round. Then down here to fun stones, uh, this is an emerald from Lake Manyara, Tanzania, according to one lab. Uh, several other labs have not been able to give us a uh, an origin, but it's just a fun one because we, we keep having problems with origin, but we love it, so we've kept it. And then this is arguably one of the most rare gems out there. It is a Wadeite, uh, named after Arthur Wade, and it's six carats, 55 points. Just a really fun stone, and it's, it's just, yeah, it's from Ogok, and it's really rare. So that's kind of the stuff we like to do. Beautiful, rare, hard to come by, not your everyday stone. I'll give you a few things. Uh, to augment what Carl said, this was one of the the largest, finest one we got out of the Queen, and that went to David P. Wilbur in probably 1975 or six, uh, and then he sold it to a, a collector, and about 
10 or 12 years ago, I was able to buy his entire uh, cut stone collection from that collector. Uh, it's last, amazing the amount of stuff that has passed through Lord Wilbur's hands. Dave Wilbur was one of my chief, I mean, he probably helped me as much as anybody in the world. He is un unbelievable. This is interesting. Stuart, mine, we bought this, uh, Will and I, at the uh, Denver show last year. And the guy had the notebook with him, and it was from the 1960s, early 60s, and it said cut by George Ashley, which, of course, we knew. George wow. Ashley was a really top cutter from uh, Pala. So this is a really old Stuart Lithia, way before our time. Yeah. And the Waiteite is interesting because when it was brought to me, uh, it was, they knew in Mogok that it was something unusual. They didn't know what it was. It went to GIA, they could not tell. It went to GIA in New York, they couldn't tell. And they sent it to Jeff Post at the Smithsonian and he got it. So it's being written up right now by uh, AGL, Chris Smith, and uh, it's a pretty special stone. As far as we know, it's a one-off. So there's just interesting things that-, that, that That's look, quite unusual uh, that you have a, a one-off stone that is so large like that, isn't it? Yeah, this is really unusual. There's another beautiful one-off from Mogok that LA County got donated by one of my people that I associate with, almost a partner, Chowtu, in Mogok. In fact, I got an email from him yesterday <laughs> and uh, asking me how we were during the times and uh, hopes I can visit him next year. But uh, he had nothing to do with this stone, but he got Chowtuite, thanks to Tony Kemp and the uh, people at LA County. He donated it to him, but it's less than one carat, as I remember. Yeah, and this is a tiny one. large and beautiful. Obviously hey, Bill, from the gem gravels. Bill, could you put a torch on the tanzanite, on the cut tanzanite there? Yeah, well, I, Carl picked that out just before his daughter was born, my granddaughter. And look at this. Can you see it? Yeah. There's a blue torch. Look at that. Woo. That is crazy. Yeah, I mean, I've. We have a larger one. We have 140 carat that I got through yeah, Bill course, Barker. But this is, this is this is really beautiful. I really like this one. And this is unreal. When you talk about, you know, we had lots of arguments over what Pariba and what isn't. When you see that, though, that's pretty is fabulous. Do they, do they still call it Pariba type if it's not from Brazil? It depends on which it depends on which uh, lab is asserting it. Most labs call it uh, in the trade. This is known as Pariba. That's how they couch it. Pariba okay. type. Or Pariba type. Yeah. Yeah. So there's Pariba from Pariba, Pariba from Rio Grande do Norte, Pariba from Nigeria, and Pariba from Mozambique, where <laughs> or copper bearing terminates. Only those four localities. Can but you I mean, tell the, us the, the name originally came from the first locale in Brazil. Correct. That's correct by the Battaglia mine. But that's a very small production compared to Rio Grande do Norte. That's Rio Grande do Norte is by 90% of the Brazilian, which is owned by Hans van der Wild and the Paul Wild Company. And they're good friends of ours. There's some Battaglia. Just different colors. Yeah. Those are probably no heat. Uh, the one on the right is probably heated. Natural and natural. Yeah. But don't focus on that. <laughs> <laughs> B, can we okay, see we'll go back the spinel, now. Thanks, Carl. Can we see yeah, the spinel? Has a question. The oh, spinel. you want to see the spinel? She wants yes. to see the spinel. A little bit closer. Wow, mm -hmm. what a color. It's got some fingerprints on it. Yes. Actually. That's Burmese. That's great. That's really <laughs> rare. With the yellow, no heat. God, that yellow really pops. That's incredible. Out yeah. of all the yellows, I had two. I had a 28 carat, which I sold to a really good friend of mine, and then kept this one. You can they get large. Up. You can get large size yellow, but to get one that glows is much more rare than large size. A lot of times, they're kind of washed out. No okay. um, So this one is just. This is probably better than even Harvard has. Don't. And I know they have a pretty good one. <laughs> so you can get bigger, but just in terms of color saturation, you don't we, see better. We've than that. had we've had up to three hundred carats, but you know this this one is just exceptional in its color. I think Eloise has a lot of secret things. Do you have you brought your gems out of the bank, Eloise? Is that we still can respond? She's she on can't screen. respond. Oh, no problem. She's well, probably be no. shaking her head vigorously. <laughs> I know they. I know they. Don't have talk fabulous, about that, Bill. <laughs> they have two fabulous peridotes that went to the bank that from Egypt. Unbelievable crystals that are about like this. I know yeah. they still have them. <laughs> 
Uh, we cut to Eloise for a second, but I think she has her camera off. So right, you Bill. told me, Raquel yeah, told me, and you told me that people, <laughs> the people watching this like to see crystal. So, you know, I went up and picked out with Will and Rika a few crystals in my personal collection. So this is a natural aquamarine. Obviously grew in Felspar and then went into the pocket here. And this is virtually flawless. Wow, it's water clear and the color, the color saturation is incredible. Either that or I'm, I'm seeing your shirt through it. But I No, it's unbelievable quality. Color. Yeah, there you go. This piece was in a, a dealer's collection for years and he priced it way ahead of his time. And back in the 70s it, or 80s, whenever it was, he wanted $60,000 for it and people like fainted. <laughs> and then it went up to six figures. And I finally was able to do a deal when I uh, did sell a certain red rock uh, that I was able to buy this <laughs> to, to salve my pain, knowing I would probably get it back someday. But that's how I wound up with this. Fantastic. Where do you see I don't from, know. If for me, this is my favorite aqua I've ever seen. Bill, what's the locale of it? Uh, it no one knows exactly. It's in Peter Bancroft's book. Uh, it's, I think it's labeled Teflo Tony or something, which is meaningless because that's just an area. Uh, right. But um, I should show it to some of the top Brazilian collectors. They'll probably know. There are, there's a mama, a mama one and a baby one. And those belong to a certain collector in New York that doesn't like to show things. Oh, I know who you're talking about. So this is the daddy one is what you're saying. This is the daddy one. He's bugged me to sell it to him for years. He could have had it, but he just, I don't know. He just wanted to get it at a better deal. I just paid the guy his price. Stupendous. And what glue did you use to put the two parts together? Uh, it's a very good, I think it's called Gorilla Glue. Okay, good, good. <laughs> you see the, the felspar that's left over, huh? Yeah. But obviously it went into the pocket and then changed the chemistry, the pressure, something changed and it became flawless. They say tourmalines, when I talked to Dick Johns over the years, uh, and I'm sure all, many people now believe it, uh, the tourmalines are formed flawless and then the pocket rents and they become those included like that, a typical tourmaline. So there's your aquamarine. Um, you know, um, maybe these two. Stick with Brazil. What's that? Brazil. If you can bring the. So part of the fun of collecting is collecting things that are illustrated or you know, become famous. So these two pieces, I knew very well from a great artist named Equit. And the gentleman who owned these, this so was the found in the 30s. About? Equit, absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, yeah. there it is. He was the finest mineral artist of his time. I mean, incredible man. Yeah, I, I, he stayed in my home and he stayed in many people's homes. Uh, he was with me, lived with me for about seven weeks when he was doing illustrations. This is from his first book. And this is the actual illustration. But, but he did things for me uh, later that it just, it was fun to watch him. He used one hair sometimes. Yeah, and he'd use those, a silver pencil that was literally a piece of silver that was filed down to right. this as thin as it could be. I mean, the guy was. So incredible. you know too, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I have I all of his books. I spent two weeks with him wandering around Germany. He took me to yeah. Germany, where he grew up. I mean, just we wonderful. had a, we had a lot of fun. I had a yeah. BMW 3.0 CS. Uh, your dad had one of those. He had a 2800, even even more rare. But oh, I, I gave it to Equit, and he would drive it around while he was, and then he'd come back and paint. We had a lot of fun for five six weeks, uh, the first time. Then he came back another time. So I mean, we had I got to know him quite well. Yeah, it's a great guy. But I love, I love when, when we get to see the paintings and we get to see oh, the minerals that he painted. Yeah. Because he always so this painted one to one. So the, the size of his painting was the exact size of the mineral. Right. This isn't painted. It's photographed in a couple of magazines. This is a reason that a top, top collector who uh, wanted to buy this from me, he wouldn't buy for a while, but now he does. But I wouldn't sell this to him. He didn't understand. It was a gift from Dr. Edward Gublin, another great mentor. Gublin took care of me. We met him in 1971 when he was at the AGS Conclave in San Diego. And they took the bus up to the Stuart mine and promptly got it stuck on one of the back, <laughs> on one of the roads up. So, right. 
I got to know him very well and he bought rare stones from us. So this is a pretty special piece. It's from the Allen Kaplan pocket. It came to him through uh, Dr. Herman Bank and then to him and then he knew I would appreciate it. And so I never have sold it, even though the offer was serious six figures. So that's from Dr. Gublin's collection. Well, I mean, you've got to emotionally, Brazil. not just financially, which is kind of a, a real sign of a true collector. Yeah, you just have to hang on. So this is a piece that, that Laurent Thomas, a great friend of, of all of ours here, especially Eloise, because they're both French and have fabulous taste. I love Laurent. He found this in one of the great, well-known mines of Madagascar. It is a liticodite. And my son, Will, saw it, and it was already sold. And that was about seven years before it showed up again at the St. Marie show, and was because he had squawked about it the first time. Uh, it was brought back to us by another dealer, American dealers, and they worked out a, an exchange with us. So I was able to get it really uh, excitingly. Look at the termination. For liticodite, it's pretty fantastic. That is stupendous. The color and the clarity of that is just unbelievable. I mean, it's amazing how you lose things and they come back to you. Well, I mean, but that's a good point. You have to stay engaged. You have to show Absolutely. up. Sometimes showing up is half the game right there. Showing up, being interested. So that's, that's quite a little code. I've never seen one like that before. Oh, well, this is, you like to, you mentioned books, so. There's the Christmas tree, which is, you know, world famous and should be. So this book, oh, there it is. Look at that. Number 60. <laughs> oh, look at the date. 1886. 86. You liked one-to-one. -one. There it is. Yeah. Absolutely one-to-one. -one. <laughs> you know, the sick part is I think they were going to make a bolo tie out of it. It's been ground on the back. Well, thank God you stopped Wilbur from doing that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Wilbur, he would have rocked that. Oh, he would have. <laughs> it would have matched Dave, his Yeah, he could have worn that. He could have got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> we love Dave. Oh, my goodness. So that's how I got it. It was in the museum like that. And no. uh, they didn't like that. And they hadn't turned it over for that many decades. That's part of the reason the museum stopped trading is over this, in the 1970s between you know, many, many museums all over the world, they traded out certain things they probably shouldn't have. I have one other that's coming up later that you'll get a kick out of, the famous Kunzai. Is later. that California? Next? This is California. It's Where? from the Spanish dry diggings. It, it's got the, the label on it says, extraordinarily rare, beautiful, exceptional crystal. It's a single crystal. It's a dendritic crystal, but it's a single crystal. Look at that thing. Yeah. That's great. That's I turned great. down when I sold the when I sold the snail. I turned down from the same gentleman a uh, seven-figure cashier's check for this. I knew I would never get this back. I knew there was a chance on the road to side. Yeah. This would have gone to somebody else. So you hear a lot about Diaptes, and you heard I love Charlie Key. Well, Charlie Key has brought in a lot of things in this world. And about 20 years ago or so, he told us about big dioptases. Well, funny enough, my first trip with Ed Sabota in 1971, one of the places Ed wanted to go to was Angola. And we did go to Angola. And we were looking for the two-inch dioptases that were written up in the literature, but no one knew exactly where they were at. Uh, the only thing I remember from Angola was I got anemic dysentery there, uh, which was really exciting. Uh, especially when we flew to Mozambique and, uh, you know, it's not I heard easy. you weren't allowed to sit next to him on the airplane. I wasn't able to sit by anybody later. <laughs> so uh, we, we made it. He finally bought me some medicine, you know, in Mozambique. We didn't have any medicine in Angola. So <laughs> it was pretty grim. But uh, Charlie Key later found these in Cocoville, which is right on the Angola border. And I believe these were the ones that Ed and I were looking for. Sure, sure. But that was probably the finest one that, that uh, Charlie ever got. He sold it to Marshall Sussman, who was very kind enough to let me buy it a few years ago. Stupendous. Got and it reminds me of the trip to Angola and uh, the joys. When I went to the, uh, the Scripps Institute, they went, oh, yeah, yeah, you'll outgrow it, which I did finally. <laughs> <laughs> 
So here's an interesting thing. There's a $10 pyrite on a $10 quartz, but what a piece. When you don't worry about value, you just look at greatness. Look this at is it. dug by a friend of Will's and mine named Joe George. He's a tremendous self collector. And he was kind enough to sell this to a friend of mine, John Sagerman, who suffered two trips to Burma with me. <laughs> I don't think he suffered too much. He enjoyed it. He went back, let's say that. And um, he was he was kind enough to let me get this last year. I had something he wanted, and uh, he had this. So he and Joe George was happy we got it. But that's a piece. That's from Washington State. That's Never been cleaned by a lab. That's just the way it came out of the ground. I mean, it's been basically washed. Wow. If we give this to Pizzota, it'll come out mirror bright. Yep. Brian, and can this, we launch the board? Keeping with tourmalines just for fun. Yeah. I mean, you go Jonas is... Sorry, sorry. We for, for we're going to go ahead and launch the poll, and we'll put it on to the side there. But, okay. uh, Bill, why don't you continue then? Oh, okay. Okay, so, I mean, you know I collect tourmalines. So the Jonas Pocket, I have an amazing one at home. But uh, we thought, here's one that not many people have seen. And the rare part of this is the diameter here. There were very few of this diameter that didn't get cut. And then the top crystal, of course, is double terminated. This came from Jonas himself. Uh, it was sold to uh, a, a friend of mine in, in Dallas, Rob Levinsky. You all know Rob. And then Rob has done many, many deals with me over the years. I could usually trade him all sorts of things, and he would look out for me for fine things. So and it's, been a, it's been a mutual uh, thing. Bill, we've got about 15 minutes left in the show, so I'm going to uh, ask you if we can fast track on some of the things that uh, you know. That There's I not many more. You're going to be happy. Okay, good. Okay. Tourmaline just last, you know, I mean, you've got to see things like this. We'll save this from the cutters. Look at that. Can you see that it's gem quality? Absolutely. That was being cut in Hans Vernerville's Paul Wild Company. And they said, we don't think you can afford this, which we probably couldn't. But Will called one of his friends, and they helped us out on a loan. And uh, we saved it for posterity. That's from Afghanistan. That's the really top color. Wow. Wow. So you had to pay cutter, uh, cutter price for that. That was six figures. Yep. And then you knew I'd been mining with Wayne Thompson, another one of my competitor mentors, one of my best friends on the planet. Uh, we did a lot of mining in the red cloud, and this came out last year. And I just saw you get a kick out of seeing that we still did find a few things. Now, in the era of COVID, there's not going to be any mining there now. But anyway, this one exists. It probably got to go to Pizzota again. And uh, we like Palladini's trimming. So that'll be a, quite an amazing piece when it's done. So are you going to continue with the Red Cloud? Can we expect to we see hope. more Red Cloud pieces? We hope. Okay. So in talk about famous and serendipity. So this is a pretty well-known Kunzite. The J.P. Morgan collection. There's Dr. Kunz with his favorite Kunzite. And that's the piece that he has in the photograph. And then here's the original gouache, and it says Tiffany and Company right here, stamped uh -huh. in. So how did this come out of the American Museum? Well, Dr. Peter Bancroft went back there with a very rare anhydrite from Switzerland. And Brian Mason was the curator, and Vince Manson was his underling, and, they, and Pete was turned into the collection, and he made a list of five pieces. He, he had a, a blue topaz from Russia, this kunzite, and there was like number two or three on the list. Uh, number four was a king mine tourmaline, whatever. And Brian went through, he said, oh, you want the blue to oh, you want the toe kunzite, you want a uh, king mine tourmaline. I think we better cut it off right here. <laughs> now, Pete was willing to trade for any one of them. And Brian was busy or whatever, who knows. And they had a better kunzite as far as a crystal. And Vince had just been there recently. And I have that story, not just from Dr. Bancroft, who worked for me for about five years. That was a tail wagging the dog, Pete working for me. <laughs> and what a jewel of a guy. And, uh, and then I got to confirm from, Pete, from, uh, from uh, Nance and Vince. He said, yeah, yeah, I remember that very well. He said, I better cut it off here. And Pete personally choked and <laughs> took his pieces and went. 
So that's how that piece got away. What year was it found, Bill? Someone asked him. Oh, this is a night. Well, the book is 1904. So that piece existed before 1904. The big pocket. I think it's from the treasure pocket in the Palette Chief. Now, there are two better crystals <clears throat> that belong to Harvard. <laughs> so, and I've seen them with Cliff Frandell, who was a jewel of a curator, and now they have a jewel of a curator with Raquel. So my son has seen them, you know, obviously uh, all of us have held them and looked at them. But this one is the famous one. That is the one. Yep. Piece of history. And then other things that get away from museums. This came from the American, I guess it must have come from the, before the American Museum. It's a J.P. Morgan gift to, to um, uh, what's the, the, um, the great guy in, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, it was a gift from J.P. Morgan. But look at this piece. It's from Pal Chief. Undoubtedly, it's from the same jewel pocket. It's Andrew Carnegie. It was a gift to Andrew Carnegie, and he didn't just donate his collection to the Carnegie Museum. He kept a personal collection, which Dr. Gary Hansen purchased. This came from the Hansen collection to Wayne Thompson, who sold it to me, and it had horrible yellow glue on this where it was repaired. And we just had, again, Pizzotta take it apart, or Palladini, put it back together. I mean, this piece is now a gem. I mean, what a, what a piece. Spectacular. And I love the termination on that. Yeah, it's a special. When you see that variegated, you know it's from the Palchi. Here's yep. the largest one. I dug this in the Himalaya mine and the, where the peg was going down dip. And this is really quite a matrix specimen. I mean, it is, we, no, there are very few large diameter. It's one pocket. We had, I think there were six crystals in the large pocket. And I think I know where all of them are. I still have the best big single and then this one. And this was probably came out in... I don't know, 1992 or three sort of a thing. Wonderful. Okay, so Ed Swoboda and me, we travel around the world together in 1971, and what do we do? We told John McLean to go down dip in the Tourmaline Queen mine, and what did he do? He didn't go down dip. He went down halfway, and it got soft. Or not halfway, he went down about 30 feet, it got soft, and so he turned to the right. And he found the famous series of blue cap pockets. I urge you to read Ed's version of it, my version of it. They're basically the same thing. I wrote mine really right afterward because I was very passionate. It turned a lot of people on. Irv Brown said he got in the mineral business because he read it. The tips are shiny. The, the terminations are shiny. Our friend George Rossman, who I happen to know is watching, he's got up on Caltech uh, Y. This is from an iron but he doesn't know why at the last stage it is such. Well, look at the color. You saw that 132 carat. It came right out of the centers of one of these. It was broken. And this is what? Morganite. This is one I sold to Josephine Scripps. I got it back when she donated me or gave me her collection. Uh, it's pretty fabulous because the aesthetics, it's really a jewel with quartz. There were very few that large and that beautiful. So there were two great ones besides the candelabra. Most people know the candelabras in the Smithsonian. I traded a good one that's in the Ecole de Maine, now known as Paris Mines Tech, so Eloise has that. Uh, but the, the two besides the candelabra, Ed took home for six months to decide, he had first choice, which one he wanted. It took him six months. Sabota chose the rabbit ears, which is by far more beautiful. This is the one that Paul Desatel's like, and I liked arguably because I loved Morganite. So we were both happy. It was a win-win. And I, that the other, the rabbit ears is now the face of the Houston Museum of Natural Science. And this is my corporation's logo. And again, this is probably the most beautiful one as far as just beauty that, that I've seen. I mean, it's really extraordinary. And the, none of these have been to a lab. I mean, this has been to, to a preliminary lab, but none of the advanced labs, they don't really need it. Well, you know, there's an argument that uh, if you take such iconic pieces and send them to the lab, you're actually going to uh, change them from what everybody knows. To That's a correct. Yeah. That's correct. Well, you know that I'm working with the Min Record on a, a Burmese article. I think, believe it might be the whole issue. And I just got brought down a few things to whet people's uh, appetite. Dr. Gublin invited me to go to Burma, 1993, now known as Myanmar. And uh, I went there 37 times because I found the place was amazing. So this is a piece, a really top 
uh, Jade Ruby dealer bought because it cost nothing. I knew what it cost. It, it actually cost $12,000 in the auction. But he asked a competitor of mine $2 million for it because that's Bernie's way. You can ask whatever you want. The next time it was offered, it was 200000 the third time it was offered for 80,000 and the buyer did the terrible thing of rolling it back to the owner and in, insulted it. Then my partner, Mint So, took me there and I said I could not possibly afford it. And then Mint So had asked me and we bought it for be somewhere between 30 and $50,000. Wow. But what a crystal, that's from the old mine. God, the size, Paradox. saturation, clarity. That everything. is one of the great paradoxes of the world. Amazing. And then, of course, the king of gems is Ruby. This I got in the, the late 90s, and it took me years to get it out of Burma. You know, there was a, there was a, 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 a boy, boycott. So I finally got it out of about five years ago but this is to me look at the termination there's no repair on the calcite this is the best one i've ever seen for a mineral specimen i was extraordinarily lucky but i think i first saw it in 1997. okay who wants to see the snail snail <laughs> okay let's see it <laughs> okay oh meet her grandmother wait a minute this might be from paladini and Pizzotta. Holy crap. It's a snail. The you snail. all waited. You all waited for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a natural it's snail from there. No. No, they took it, sent it to me just like this as a gift. Well, that's the grandmother of the snail. <laughs> that's it. All right. All, all right. right. Let's see the real. real snail. All right. There's Rika. You know, the thing explodes. Yeah. This is from Jerry Rousseau, another great mentor. I met him in the 71 trip with Ed. I went back to Africa, I told you, over 40 times. And Jerry called me in the middle of the night and said, Bull, because South Africa, and he couldn't say Bill, Bull, Bull, I got the best one. And I flew down and I had to beat a really top New York dealer who specialized in Sumeb. And he'd offered the extraordinary sum of $5,000 at that time. <laughs> and nobody understood that kind of price. But what a piece, and I did beat it. And then over the years, it became really famous. And it won the award this year, the David P. Wilbur, Lord Wilbur, Award yeah, for Best Mineral in uh, Let's cut back to my camera for a second, Air. There you yeah. go. Yeah, there we go. And so um, uh, Rob Levinsky and Daniel Trinchillo have started a new tradition where every year they pick a single specimen on exhibit at the TGMS show and they award it the David P. Wilbur Award, and it's the finest specimen on display. And uh, the snail won the award for 2020. So really, Bill, congratulations, man. So this is a rhodochrosite from the Schwanning Mine in uh, South Africa. It's not actually in Namibia. Being it's near the, the matrix, town of, manganite? it's near the town, that's from Man Manganite. It's near the town of, of, of Hot as Hell, and it is in the summer. <laughs> Only it's spelled how does L. Okay, hold it up to the uh, embroidery on your shirt now. <laughs> we could do that. Fantastic. Not bad. Fantastic. That is true. So you've seen blue caps, you've heard a lot of stuff, and you wind up with the grandmother's snail and the snail. So there we are. So maybe there'll be some questions if they, anybody has time. I don't know what your schedule is, Brian. We're here. So. Okay. Well, I think uh, uh, people watching uh, are, won't be displeased if we go a little bit over. Raquel, do we have any Q&As that uh, people are asking that Bill can answer? Uh, uh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, do you have any hidden night? Hidden night? Yes. Yeah, no. I have three really good hidden Not, not handy, Not though. here, not handy. Okay. I have a certain place I keep the best specimens in, a, in, a, in the bank, so I have to bring things out. But I have three extraordinary hidden nights, one of which is pictured in the, the book by George F. Kuhn's Gemstones in North Carolina. It absolutely one-to-one. -one. 
We also have a question, it's more of uh, how was to be walking through the euros when you were collecting the, the demantoids? Oh, into the Euro Mountains? Well, yes. in 1997, I took William and Carl there, they were kids, and uh, I think Carl got to drive a boat, William got to drive a boat in the, one of the lakes there, and the mine was filled with mosquitoes, that was exciting, but we did find lots of demantoids. Will still has a cut, like 1.7 carat we cut out of one of the pieces he found, uh, you know, we did, we had, it was amazing. And then I went back to the Kladovka mine in 2004 and, or three, whatever it was, and we really hit a lot. Here's uh, Carl's bringing in, I mean, we have still left over. Uh, beautiful. That's a matched pair of demantoids. Look at that. <laughs> that worth a little less now. And that happened live, folks. <laughs> eh. So 10 carats over. They're both over five carats. Those we didn't mine. <laughs> I have to fess up. Because we mined, I know the Russian guys who are still involved. But that's, yeah. you want to talk about something rare, that's, that's rare. Bill, I'm going to ask you a question that I like to ask uh, uh, all the major uh, collectors and dealers when uh, we interview them. What are the qualities of a mineral that makes a great specimen in your, from your perspective? Well, Obviously, you, you have to know a lot. I mean, my blessing was I had all these great mentors and I got to visit museums, including the British Museum, the French Museums, uh, the Austrian Museums, and go through their drawers. So you have to compare. So you've got to, you know, what makes a mineral great is something that's perfect. Uh, you know, the color, beautiful color, although you, if it's super rare, it doesn't have to have a great color. Uh, but perfection is, is everything can be small. I used to collect thumbnails. I sold my thumbnail collection in 1977 because I was starting to like miniatures and I needed the money and whatnot. So I back in thumbnails, but you can, a specimen just has to be perfect. For me, I like color the most, obviously. That's where everybody loves rhodochrosite. Mm -hmm. It's got everything. It's got color, it's got matrix, you know, contrast, beauty. Um, but again, after you compare, how many rhodochrosites? I mean, there's fabulous rhodochrosites from Alma including the one that your father used to own, uh, Brian, which is, came from, from, Ed's, uh, from uh, Pete Bancroft through Merle Reed. And you know how Pete got it? He traded phospholite thumbnails for it, about <laughs> 20. Because yeah, he was in- A lot of time down there. He was in Bolivia when they came out and he brought back you know, hundreds of, of phospholites. So that was, it was a good way to get things because that piece was $2,500. I mean, that's back when I was at Colorado, just after Colorado School of Mines, so 1968. Can you imagine, I mean, how much money that is? Yeah, you can see up there if you have fun. Look, Colorado School of Mines, if you're broke, you get stand sterling silver. So you can still uh, eat Tau Beta Pi, you know, I got Chevalier. There's all sorts of funny things over your life that you meet. But, Good crystals, they stand out. I mean, the really rare ones, everybody knows once they've been in it a long time, the top 20, 30 dealers have no trouble picking out the best two or three pieces in any lot in a few seconds. Yeah. So it's really exposure and knowledge. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and the museums really did play a huge part in my background and my son Will's. Uh, Alan Hart, who most of you heard of, I met him when he was 16 because he was working for Dr. Peter Embry, and he was he was given the keys, and I was yeah, torturing him because making him open various drawers. I mean, hundreds of drawers. So I really knew the British Museum. I mean, I know the topazes, I knew the calcasites, I knew the Bournonites, uh, you know, really well. You know, and they had in calcasites, they probably had seven, eight drawers even before they got the British Geologic Museum added to their collection. So, so even if, you know, I mean, visit the museums, go to the shows, look at what's out there, talk to the dealers. Absolutely. And visit collections. Most collectors like to share their collections. Yeah. They know you're not there to, you know, to criticize it or do anything. I remember Dessa Tells. He told me once, he said, I, I know all these people, Bill, who come here and tell me they got a better one or that there's something wrong with this. He said, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. I love Dessa Tells. He was, he was, of all the mentors I had, he, he knew the most about crystals. He was amazing. He built the Smithsonian when the U.S. government was smart enough on the confiscated things that they got in the way of jewelry coming in from illegal whatever. They all donated Smithsonian. He turned that into mineral specimens. 
a lot through Martin Ehrman. Martin Ehrman was a jewel. I mean, I got your dad, <laughs> he was one of your dad's renters. So I got to know Martin relatively well, last part of his life. Martin had it made. He had about seven or eight dealers around the world and they would save everything for him for six months. And he would just travel there. And then he got pushed by Charlie Key and Rick Smith. And I know that they, that changed the business a lot. They wouldn't yeah, well, hold stuff for him anymore. Well, he was active before mineral collecting became a, a, a huge thing. And so he was... He survived the 30s. Uh, he bought right. a one big collection and lived off of that. I mean, Martin was amazing. He was in World War II, dropped behind the lines uh, in Germany because he was a German, obviously, spoke perfect German. I mean, he's a legend in himself. I have a lot on Martin Ehrman on Palagems, if you look up his name. We got, I knew his son, and they, they shared all sorts of things, which we posted on there. Many, uh, probably over 100 pages in four or five different articles. Yeah, you have a lot of great information there. Raquel, do we have any other questions from the audience uh, before we uh, go into the 10 questions? I think we should go into the 10 questions. And then if we have more questions and people want to stay after, maybe, and if B has time, I think we should make it, we should probably go to the poll question. Okay, perfect. Then Bill, these now, are I don't have an idea what these questions are, and I know I've No, you don't. Them. You don't have an idea, and this is how it works. <laughs> I've got 10 questions. All the readers were uh, pushed a poll, and they answered what they think you're going to answer to these 10 right. questions. Oh, well, I know. I took Patrick's test and failed it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you know. All right, question number one. Hawaiian shirt or suit and tie? Hawaiian shirt. Hawaiian shirt, of course. Uh, food, Mexican or sushi? Sushi. Sushi. Number three, what's it called? A stick shift or a manual? Uh, for me, stick shift. Stick shift. Toilet paper, over the top or underneath? Over the top. <laughs> Africa or the Orient? Oh, that's impossible. Uh, geez. That's impossible. <laughs> Got both. Reaction. I don't know. Um, I guess Burma. Orient. Burma, okay, Orient. SUV or sports car? SUV. SUV. Barbecue ribs? I drive a Range Rover. Isn't that SUV? Yeah, but you weren't supposed to tell people that. <laughs> oh. Well, Barbecue they already ribs answered. Or Barbecue ribs or steak? Oh. Barbecue ribs. Okay. Cabin in the mountains or house on the beach? House on the beach. A book or Kindle? Book. Book. And the final question, your choice of drink, margarita or wine? Oh, that's tough too. I guess right. wine. Wine, okay. All right, so Raquel, let's go down and let's hear what the uh, audience chose. Number one, Hawaiian shirt or suit and tie? Hawaiian shirt. Hawaiian shirt, right on. Okay, food, Mexican or sushi? People felt Mexican. Oh. Okay, what's it called? <laughs> A stick shift or manual? Stick shift. Stick shift. Toilet paper, over the top or underneath? Over the top. Over the top. Jesus, what Africa. a bad question. <laughs> Africa or the Orient? Africa. Ah. SUV or sports car? Almost 50-50, but they thought Bill is a sports car driver. <laughs> Wow, they need to know their Bill Larson a little bit better. <laughs> no, well, I do have an M6. <laughs> well, okay, well, that probably confused them. Barbecue ribs or steak? Steak. Steak. <laughs> Cabin in the mountains or house on the beach? House on the beach. All right. Book or Kindle? 96% book. Oh, they knew. And final one, margarita or wine? Wine. That's tough, but they got it. <laughs> okay, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six out of 10, that's a majority. We're gonna say that the people, the listeners are champions today. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's cut back to my camera for a second. We'll show this fabulous uh, uh, Malachite slice. And this is how it's gonna go. Whoever gets the first correct answer, and they need to email it to will at palagems.com. That's W-I-L-L -L at palagems, P-A-L-A-G-E-M-S.com. 
And so you have to email the correct answer. The first one who emails the correct answer, you are going to win this valued, what'd you say, Bill? A little over $1,000 here? Yep. Okay. So here's what you have to do. You have to go to the website, palaminerals.com. That's P-A-L-A-M-I-N-E-R-A-L-S.com. And I think uh, Eloise might be uh, putting that URL in the chat window. Go to palaminerals.com. And, and Bill was talking a lot about mentors in his interview. So you need to find an article talking about one of his mentors that we refer to as... I'm gonna make this gender neutral. So this person is the Renaissance person. Find that person's name, email that person's name to will at palagems.com. The first one who gets that email into, um, uh, into will will win this fantastic uh, uh, Malachite slice there. And with that, we're coming to the end of our show. Bill, thank you so much for spending thank time you. and your crazy treasures with us. Well, it was great fun. Thank Hope you. everybody enjoyed it. And uh, let me just make a final announcement. We were talking about Patrick Dreher earlier today, and we saw a lot of his great pieces. Patrick Dreher's interview from four weeks ago is going to be going live on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. Look for the announcements on our Facebook pages. Also, you can go to the Blue Cap um, uh, um, YouTube channel to find that there. Tune in again next week. We're going to have uh, Jolien Ralph from uh, Mindat. Wait, hang on. I'm sorry. That's Doctor Who there. That's not Jolien. There's Jolien. Okay, we're going to have Jolien Ralph from Mindat as our guest next week. Same time, August 19th. Same time, same channel. So, Bill, again, thank you so much. And if you can hang out to ask any other questions that our viewers may have, really appreciate it. For those who have to tune out, we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bill, do you have a minute for a couple of questions? We don't, we're not doing a thing. Okay. It's only 11 here. <laughs> so we have Thomas. He was, uh, he was interested to know if you would have started to build a business, would you focus on gems or minerals instead? Raquel, well, it depends on your passion. To, I'm, I'm sorry, Bill. Let me interrupt you for a quick Go. sec. Let's cut back to Bill's camera because I'm sure when they hear the sorry. answer, they don't want to be looking at me. Sorry, yes. There you go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So will you focus on gems or minerals? Well, it would depend on your passion. Uh, if you're a young person and you, you uh, have the time, one of, one of the things that uh, I tell the young people who come to me who want to get in the business is you have time. You can go, maybe you can travel to a foreign country and get to know where they're producing things, get to know the local people, and, uh, but you have to know where you're going to sell it. So and if you're going to do gems, if you could afford it, go to GIA because their their uh, course is amazing. It's six months, but it's quite you know it's it's like going to university. It's not inexpensive. Bill, so do you like, see uh, one field as it, being more competitive than the other? Is gems hard? Well, is depends on your passion. If you're passionate about gemstones, you'll you'll make it. If you're not, I don't think you will. I mean, you know, it's like anything else. You got to, especially in, when you're dealing with things that are collectibles. Uh, crystals, you really have to be passionate. If you, because that's a really hard business. So I, I know a lot of very wealthy people who in the 70s. Uh, he became a collector. He, he, in fact, I would name him Norm Pellman because he's passed on. He was a jewel of a guy, and he got in the mineral business. And later, he came to me and he said, "I don't know." And he talked to others. Herb Abode, he says, "I don't know how you guys make a living. Everybody wants something until you have it. And once you have it, they don't want it. You're stuck with it." Uh, he didn't know you had to go to many shows. Sometimes you get lucky, you sell something in a day. Sometimes it'd be years. I think Carl sold gems. He told me that he was celebrating 10-year birthdays on it, that I made mistakes buying or whatever. Uh, you just don't know. And you, But if you're passionate about crystals, you love it. You love your inventory. Only buy what you love. Um, unless you're in dealing on YouTube and things like that, whatever it is, uh, you know, those people can buy a quantity of stuff and uh, we know some of those people get into more advanced crystals. I mean, obviously going to the shows, interesting. But it's generally, it's the long game that you have to be playing. You have to put the time well, in, you got to do the travel, you got to make the connection. Somebody who tries to come in and out, I mean, or come in and make a big splash, they better either be very wealthy or, or not worry about losing a lot of money because you'll make a lot of mistakes in any business. I mean, if you're in a, uh, you, you know, antique cars think about that or paintings or anything that's a collectible is not easy 
Well, you know, there's the old joke in the scuba diving world. How do you make a small fortune in scuba diving? Start with a large Start with a large fortune. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen a lot of that in my industry, both gems and and minerals. I mean, it's really and a lot. I mean, I have my whole family involved. I mean, you know, uh, but I, you know, with Ed, we started it from nothing. I mean, I, I was selling stones uh, when I was 12. I mean, you know, to build up, I use the Schneiders, would buy what I'd find in the dumps. And then when I went to Colorado School of Mines, I would get from Ralph Potter, I'd get the long, thin pencils that I remember I you would buy a dozen of them and take them back to Merle Reed. And then he would either, he would pay me what I paid and then give me a trade on top of it. I was pretty transparent with him, but this was a thousand dollars and there would be 10 pencils that would be worth a thousand each now. But you know, that's, I found out what he wanted. He wanted things from California. So, but I, I'd been selling for basically, you know, 10 years before I met Ed. Well, you know, it's interesting. Back uh, when you did the Golden Age of Minerals at the Westward Look Show with Charlie Key and Steve right. Bancroft and my dad, Ed Swoboda, you made a comment um, uh, during that presentation where you said that uh, you started, you and, uh, and my father started mineral dealing before mineral dealing was really a thing. That's and pretty much true. To the time that you have spent in the industry. Now mineral dealing is a much bigger thing with, with much bigger uh, dollars, but the knowledge that you have, and I keep pushing Will to sit down with you and continue doing those recordings, <laughs> because that information that you have in your brain is absolutely priceless, and it needs well, to be recorded. I've seen a lot, done a lot. Don't forget, there was a golden age of mineral dealers prior to 1900. I mean, there was, there was, you know, other times, you know, in England and France and whatnot, but in the United States, after the depression, after 1929, uh, mineral dealers were pretty much defunct. Uh, probably only Martin Ehrman survived uh, as far as a major person. And uh, then you got Norm Dawson came in and, and he worked in a school as a part-time. So, you know, I mean, his, his mineral dealing was, was, was a hobby and he right. was a really big dealer. So people forget that. Like you said, my dad, your dad and, and I started something that wasn't possible. I used to make $300 a month. Don't forget. That's what I was able to pull out of Palo. So it was, and I kept the thumbnails and your dad got the miniatures and the, and the, the, the cabinets. So it was interesting, but I mean, it was hard to survive. B, will you tell us about your book collection? What about your book collection? Oh, well, I've got lucky and I got involved in books because of St. Cancus, the, the great uh, mentor. And John was in the book business and he told me that you can't be a great collector unless you, you know, have a library. And I probably had about, until I really got to know him better, I had about 300 books. And then he started getting me a few. And then in the 90s, I decided books were really a good thing. And I had the Himalaya money extra a little bit. And so I, I now have 2,700 books that have been curated. They're in a, they're, they're in a PDF and I have the print. Uh, I printed five copies. So 2,700 on most of my books are pre-1920. So, you know, kind of like uh, really rare things. And, and you, you learn a lot. That's why I said there were golden ages of mineral dealers before Ed and I for sure, but they were in, you know, the 19th century, 18th century sort of things. Bill, who else has a collection? I mean, <clears throat> I always think it's uh, you and Wayne Light that probably have the finest uh, mineral book collections, at least in the United States. Well, Herb had the best single collection. The best collection is, is, uh, uh, belongs to Barry Ample by far. Okay. All right. Yeah, be fine. I mean, it's a different level. Uh, yeah. He's got things that are just, you know, he's got a first edition of Albertus Magnus. I got the third edition. Mine's still in Cunable. 1499 but his is 1460 and pristine so different level but uh, herb's collection went to an australian gold dealer, uh, gold miner or whatever so those are the four but there are probably quite a number of book collections in europe because a lot of them are you know french and german and english no, not that at all no but i was very lucky because st cancus st cancus uh, sold me uh, first choice after the, 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 the you know, most people know the story. Gee, I bought his uh, library, but he, they bought his uh, uh, library copy, the, the reading copy, uh, in many instances. So I got the finer quality, and I bought over 600 books at one shot from him. Wow! So that was that was really what popped me up into top 
book collecting. And then over the years, I got to know many, many dealers and bought amazing things. But this is before the internet changed the book. Books are really expensive now. <laughs> so that turned out to be a good, you know, at least of the really collectible ones. Now, you said that you had scanned a bunch of them into PDFs. Are those? Uh, yeah, I have a PDF. Um, I mean, I don't send it out to everybody, but I mean, I, I could send somebody like yourself uh, mm -hmm. the PDF. Wonderful. That's, that's uh, very generous of you to be sharing that. Uh, oh, it would be interesting. I, I mean, that a lot of this information is not available uh, to kind of the lay person, but. Uh, well, and this was, this was professionally done. I mean, I paid, um, what was his name? Gunther. Yeah, Gunther. Uh, to do it. And he's, okay. he's really smart. So he yeah. spent a long time doing it. He did mine. He did Cal Graber's. Cal has a very good book collection, but more uh, smaller and more like on Mexico and things like that. So sure, sure. I have a top Baja collection of books, but that's down in our condo in Baja. So you like on the beach? I'm right on the beach. So <laughs> Exactly. See, Baja's was, not quite like Hawaii, but it, it, Baja's closer. <laughs> <laughs> Raquel, do we have any other questions? No, I think uh, we already took enough time from Bill. Thank you so much, Will, Enrique, and Carl. Thanks, Larson family. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Bye-bye.